Welcome, Legion Games. I am hyped up for this. Fractured Sky, IV Games. How to play it, what you need to know, how it works, pros, cons, my thoughts, my biased opinions thrown all over the place. Let's do this if you want to know more about this freaking fantastic game. Let's talk. Let's go. Bid, control, manage. Not necessarily in that order, but that's what Fractured Sky is bringing to the table in this very different blind bid-ish style game. And let me explain a little bit of this, of first, what you're gonna be doing, how you're gonna be doing it, what you need to win, and what you need to know, and then my thoughts and opinions on it from that side of things. So as you can see in front of you now, I have what one player's personal setup is gonna look like. You have a couple different areas that you're gonna be dealing with. You have the resources, your gold, your rock, your wood. You've got your buildings over here, over here, over here. You've got your main airships that you're gonna be maneuvering here that actually have little magnets on them, and that becomes important in a second. Then you have your little skiffs that are deployable, and you also have your towers, as well as your little resource buildings, pagodas, as I like to call them, essentially. And so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be spending those resources to deploy these to areas on the map. We'll talk about that in a second. And then you are going to be gradually placing your airships out there, all three of them, until everyone has played all three airships to end the round. At the end of the round, you then take whoever is scoring the most on one of each of the islands they are rewarded subsequently based on hidden objectives, public objectives, as well as resources to be given out at each individual island as well to replenish the stocks utilized in that round to begin with. Rinse and repeat over five rounds and the winner with the most of the little stars at the end wins. Sounds simple, sounds straightforward. Let's run it through a little bit more detailed so you know how that's actually gonna be working. So as you can see on my little player sheet right here, I have several different areas that I'm going to be managing. Uh, the main thing is your airships. Your airships are gonna be deployed to one of the various areas below me here on the islands. You're gonna be deploying them to any island in which you so choose. On a turn-by-turn -turn basis, round-by-round -round action, you are going to be going one action, one action, one action, until subsequently everyone is passed and run out of airships to place at the end. If you cannot do anything else, you must play an airship on one of the islands. Now, there's no limitation to the number of airships on an island, so you can have as many as you want there. But if you are the first one there, you get rewarded by getting an extra card. That card becomes very important because you're gonna be drawing one of these Starfall deck cards that are going to be available to you, and they run you through all of the areas that are gonna be present on the map depending on the player count. And why that's important is because at the beginning of the game, each round you will slowly have more areas that are going to have hidden windfalls at the end of the round only to be discovered where these winning victory point starfall gems are going to be located and so when you are the first at one of these islands you get to draw one of the ones that was not selected so a la a little bit of reverse clue you start to know where not to put your airships potentially later in the round and as the rounds go on more and more of these are subsequently going to put down so less of them are in the unchosen pile so there's less that you're going to need to avoid now, with this game, also, it would be not complete if you didn't also have hidden objectives to go along with this here. You have a massive pile of hidden objectives, five of them, that are going to supply you with different ways to get those said stars for victory points in case you can't position your airships correctly and outmaneuver and outbid your opponents in the first place. We'll talk about how these are revealed and their uh, interaction component in a little bit here. But going back to the map, you have your other components that you are putting down. As you put your airships down, though, we have to talk about the main aspect aspect of this game. You can see here when I blow this up, I have 12 tokens that I will be utilizing to my collection here, ranging from 0 to 10. And that's important because when we go back to these ships, as I place these ships on a turn-by-turn -turn basis, I have to take every single time one of these chips, magnetically click it right there, and then place it face down so no one knows what I'm actually playing where. Now, the tricky part with this is you have 0 to 10, like I mentioned. Why do you have zeros, Chris? Well, because the only thing that matters about where and when you bid is that the sum total of all three of them can't be more than 10. 
So if you're bidding 10 on one, well, that's why you have two zeros as well. How you position them, how you decide to do the numerical composition is completely up to you. After you've placed all of your airships, you run into the other dynamic of this game. Once you've done that, you take your turn marker and you move it subsequently to the first open spot on the player turns. And so then that determines the player turn order for the next round. And so that is highly variable depending on how quickly you put your airships out there in the first place. Now going back to the rest of my player board here for a second. As I mentioned, you have resources that you will be gathering. Those are going to be coming from the islands themselves when you score for them each end of round then you're also going to have your towers and your stations and your skiffs your stations here are going to be placed in the areas between the various islands and these are going to give you an extra resource if they are adjacent via these lines to one of the islands that you place them on you're going to get an extra resource when you gather those resources then the towers themselves are going to give you an extra strength there in addition. So not only now do I have my eight sitting there, but I have my tower, which is also adjacent here, which gives it a strength of nine. And the other important thing to note about these is that these are not reclaimed round by round. Your airships are, your skiffs are, but your buildings stay out there. Your skiffs do the same thing as airships. They add a strength of one though, consistently, but just like your airships, they get removed at the end of the round and are available for further use. And you can see as I slide this back up, each of these has their own resources. Your stations are two wood, your towers are three stone, and then your skiffs are one wood and one stone. Makes sense. Chris, you haven't talked about the third resource, gold. We'll get there in just a second. So as you can see, going back to this map, talking about a couple of these places, you can see that if you get resources here, you're gonna be getting two gold. You have a stone and a wood, stone and a gold. And so you're gonna be getting those resources. Well, how do you get those resources? Well, if you are first at one of the areas that has one of the mysterious stars at the end of the round, well, you just get the victory point, right? But if you're second, you get both resources. If you're third, you get the choice of one of your resources. And so you slowly replenish your supplies depending on how you do. You'll notice that as I zoom out here, there are a lot more spaces than there are ship availabilities of covering because especially in the early rounds, you're only going to have one, two, or even possibly three as the rounds go on, one, two, and three consecutively, respectively, uh, situations where the resources are going to be overlapped with the stars. So if you're spreading out and not getting the stars, well, there's a good chance that you're gonna get a lot more resources as well. How do you decide who wins? Well, you just look at the end of the round. You say, oh, green has eight, Purple has three, green wins. If there was a star there, they'd get the star, purple get the two gold, there you go. That's how you determine things, essentially. If purple or green had one of these little stations there, well, then they get an extra resource, potentially, of their choice if there were two different resources. That's how you're scoring at the end of the round. Now, let's talk about how you're gonna be scoring at the end of the round otherwise as well. Now, this board here, this is the objective board. Now, this is gonna have four different areas that you need to know about. Scouting and peaking being the main one. You're gonna have the two different objective cards as well. So as you go each round, you're gonna be adding one of these cards to each spot subsequently based on the round number. And so how you get to know potentially where these are and where then to place your airship, and that's now where your gold resource comes in. If you cash in two gold resources, you can choose to either scout and look at this card or scout and look at the objectives, which we'll talk in a second. And the objectives go right up here at the top, right across respectively. Now there are five always at the top here each round. This is going to be round dependent, hence the numbers there. You have three different areas in which you're going to be potentially placing in, as you can see based on my cubes here. The top this is basically peaking. You're peaking at these objectives. And so you get to look at this and you get to see what the objective is this round. And so in this case, it's had the most fortresses built when this is revealed and all of these give a victory point star. And so you'll always know what that one is. Now, this is the big point here we'll get to in a second, the difference between this top row and the bottom row. Now the bottom row, you get to also look and see where the star is going to be going. So you know the star is going to uh, the <laughs> careening cliffs in this case. And so you get to put this back face down. Now if you choose though, you can also scout 
and get a resource from that area additionally. But if you do that, you have to take it from the two that are available at the careening cliffs. And so you can see that the two at the careening cliffs are gold and stone. And so if you're subsequently paying attention to that person grabbing a resource, it starts to narrow down the resources that it could be potentially referring to on the map below us again, right? And so that's why you may want to, you may also not want to, and then subsequently you're going to play in this area. Now, you can see that there's the middle row and then the bottom row. The middle rows here are the big difference. Why would you, Chris, ever want to do this one necessarily as opposed to these? Well, the main issue is at the end of the round, as I mentioned earlier, you reclaim your airships, but your buildings stay out. On this phase of things, the reclamation, you reclaim everything on this blue side. But the orange over here, anything in those areas stays objective wise. And so that's where the difference is immediate gratification versus delayed satisfaction. Make sense? Now, as I mentioned, this game plays two to five players. However, you actually have an AI automa if you choose to play with the two player. It's demanding that you have three people in the game. And so that's why this game is really meant for three to five, although it can be played at two. Your mileage may vary, obviously. Now, you may be wondering, Chris, well, if I'm just pulling these chips, aren't the, my opponents just going to know which ship I'm putting down under the airship in the first place? Well, I didn't show you this, but we also have these handy dandy little blinders uh, that go right over here that will block your opponent from seeing it. Now, this is obviously just a prototype, and these come off very easily. Now, the production on this side of things, Ivy Games has already told us that this is not final. Uh, the magnetic is going to be different. The inlay here is going to be actually in it, so it's not just, uh, you know, kind of floating there. And same thing with the blinder here. Uh, it's going to be completely different in terms of how it's going to actually be looking. So don't take any of that for final value. They already assured us of that, and be frank, it does kind of do that really easily. So not a big deal whatsoever. Uh, you know, just put your hand over it if you're like me, right? Uh, but that's the gist of the game. You rinse and repeat all of that through five rounds, managing your resources, using your buildings, and then placing your airships, maneuvering them ever so cautiously to get the most stars that you can in combination between where they're just falling for free and the hidden objectives that you're slowly going to want to be peeking in on, trying to get the upper hand on your opponents on a round-by-round -round basis. That's it. So what are my thoughts on this? Pros, cons, judgments. Pros. This is, you know, being marketed right now as IV Games' most accessible game. And I'll be completely transparent here that this is more accessible than their other ones. Uh, this is probably better in terms of the group dynamic than Veiled Fate. Because Veiled Fate becomes a very, very meta game. Nothing against it, but you need to know it's a meta-esque social deduction game. And the more meta, the better the game. If your group isn't getting regularly enough together to play that game consistently, it's going to not be as dynamically exciting, right? And so this uh, lowers the barrier to entry from that standpoint of, okay, bid and put stuff out and, you know, have fun with it and bluff and try and guess where other people are going based on, you know, what they're putting down, where they're putting stuff down in the first place. And so it just makes it more accessible. And I agree with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. It's easier to manage, but it doesn't lose some of the nuance. It's not going to be overall as thinky necessarily, though, obviously at the same time, right? Also, depending on the player count, there is a five player board on the other side. And so you're going to have two additional spots of islands that you're going to be managing uh, to put all your little ships down, if you will. And then you're also going to have a few more spots in between. And again, the spots in between are really potentially sometimes the make it or break it because you can really get some beneficial resources gathered from placing your stations or your towers <laughs> um, in those spots because they just never leave. And so the dynamic of when do I place those down because they're there for the rest of the game and you can't knock anybody out versus I need to get those resources and my airships in place first or peek at the objectives to try and get the victory points early, that's the dynamic that you're bringing and it does it rather smoothly. No complaints. I like the turn order aspect of things because I always hate games that require you to like put your marker or your airship on a spot 
to kind of waste a worker to get first turn. I just hate that. That's one thing in worker placement games that I am personally speaking not a fan of. And so this game rewards you for, you know, adventuring out there more <laughs> advantageously or more foolhardy, if you will, at the same time of placing all of your airships out there and thus rewarding you with going first in the next round. Because if you want to get some of these resources, um, it's going to be easier or potentially more <laughs> behooving if you have only limited spots in between as well to go first to get the spot that you want subsequently. So yeah, there's an advantage, but you're gonna pay a price, not in workers, but maybe in a slightly less advantaged spot in the previous round. And so I like that dynamic of a worker placement risk reward cost benefit analysis ratio much better, personally speaking. The resources, they're plentiful enough. Once you get a couple stations out there, once you start gathering, and you know, again, this is the dynamic, going for those objectives at first is highly underutilized. Everyone's like, oh, well, the stars are falling, right? The objectives really matter. They really matter. And unless you gather and harness resources in order to, you know, keep an eye on them, falling stars is not just going to win it for you. And so you're going to have to balance the two of them. And I like that aspect of things cons you know for people looking for something drastically strategic this is much less strategic than the other games this is much less strategic than veiled fate it's much less strategic than mythic mischief i mean that is you know strategy in a nutshell right that's an abstract style game with a theme incorporated this is nothing like that and it's not just bidding if you want to bid, this is not just an auction bidding style game. If you're looking for something like that in order to win, in order to gather resources, this is completely not that. The bidding in that sense is you blindly bidding in areas that you have no clue what your opponent is going to be doing and may not until the final reveal and you have very little way to mitigate it, right? As I mentioned, you've got the little towers. The little towers are only going to contribute one meaningful contribution from these towers is going to be hard at best and that's probably the weakest point right you can't score one of these based on just a tower alone you need to have an airship and you need to have an airship with value and so that's the tricky point of where these towers are going to be having to be positioned they're you know not just capable of winning anything by themselves and so you have to balance where they are with where they can be useful in addition and that's potentially going to frustrate people um the utility of these from that aspect it's also going to frustrate people with some of these blue cards the starfall cards themselves because they're high risk high reward especially at the lower rounds the lower rounds, you know, like I said, there's one Starfall card out there. You have a whole deck of them that are not where the star is. So, you know, your chances of it really being beneficial are much lower. As it goes on further in the rounds, yeah, I mean, they become more beneficial to draw. But as I said, you know, the objectives where there's five out there, where peeking at it tells you automatically what one of the objectives is going to be. So that's where, you know, I can see it being a little bit uh, concerning or, you know, being a little bit critical from that aspect of things. If you're really one of those people who's going to math it out and say, where is this most beneficial resource management wise? So what are my final thoughts on this? My main comparison to this, uh, this thing that gives me the most vibes of is Ethnos. And, you know, I am not a big fan of Ethnos. You know, I'm not a big fan of the area control uh, with the set collection matching. I like this bidding better. And I like the fact that the majority of the stuff gets removed off the map because I think the biggest problem I have with some area control games that are like Ethnos in the first place is once you get your guys out there, it's very hard to catch up. It's a runaway leader issue. And this doesn't give you that dynamic necessarily. If you're going for the objectives, you can go for the objectives and you can go for the areas that you're shooting for. And so you get to do more of both rather than just, okay, I'm going to gather this big set collection for this big area. Now, I know Ethnotes isn't distilled down to that, but it just makes me feel like there is a more dynamic game lurking, churning, riptiding underneath the surface of this game than there potentially is in that.
my own personal preference, obviously, my own bias that I mentioned at the beginning. Again, one of the other strengths of this is that you could easily, very easily build upon this game with one or two other extra little things to give it a little bit more of a tactical nature or a strategic depth, very easily. I can see this being very adaptable, very maneuverable. I don't know anything that's going to be going on in the campaign apart from what they've told us, uh, you know, but I'm assuming that there are going to be potentially other little things to go along the way. I wouldn't be surprised, just like with Mythic Mischief or Veiled Fate, if there was another little module or expansion even from that aspect. All in all then, if I was to say to you, of the games I have, Moonrakers, Veiled Fate, Mythic Mischief, okay, now this one, how does this compare? Where does this rank? For me, if I'm pulling one of them out for a larger player count, which kind of right there excludes Mythic Mischief as much as I like abstracts, right? They're not great anything more than two player counts. Where does this one fall? How likely or how eager am I to get this one out versus the others? I'll tell you right now, I'm going to get this one out before I'm going to get out Veiled Fate or Moonrakers. For me personally, this fits my niche, my needs, my mechanistic approach of a little bit of chaos, a little bit of control, and a little bit of ha ha outmaneuvering you, all wrapped in a relatively easy to play, self contained bundle. Because again, these five rounds are very quick. This is not a lengthy, lengthy game. While you're playing five rounds, you go until everybody plays all three of their airships, which is relatively self-contained because you're only taking one action per turn. And it's a shorter game, an hour-ish underneath, even if you have five players. And so it does that appeal to you. Are you looking for something more strategic depth, more length of time that you're building up your empire for? If you are, well, this isn't gonna give it to you. But if you want something, again, that hits the table easier with an area control dynamic, well, you should give this one a look-see. And that's exactly what I liked previously about DEI from Ludus Magnus. I cannot stand games like this that sort of overextend themselves in terms of what they're trying to encompass or games like this that overstay their welcome. That is my biggest problem with many of the large name area control games. They tend to drag on, especially at the higher player counts. And me personally, I cannot stand that. Cannot stand it, especially if there is a clear dynamic of where people are at rank wise. And not only does this not overstay its welcome, it constantly allows you to get back in it even if you are previously not doing well in the prior round. And not all of those games allow for that, which again is going to be a turnoff to people. I wanna do better than people. I deserve to win. I deserve to be ahead. There is definitely that crowd. If you are that crowd, this game is not going to be right for you. But if you want some chaos, if you want some unpredictability, if you want some objectives to be able to turn the tide to allow you to get back into things when, you know, things weren't looking up for you originally because of a couple bad random placements at the beginning of the game of you guessing wrong of where the star is going to be, right? This game also allows that. And that's why I like it. And it isn't the thinky overheadness that has to be meta involved with Veiled Fate as well. There you go. Those are my thoughts, how to play, things you need to know with Ivy Games' latest Fractured Sky. Let me know, comments, questions down below. Subscribe if you want. I'm trying to get to 10K this year. So um, yeah, let me know what you think. Everything all wrapped up into one. Woo! I was listening to some DMX right before this video. That's why I was all hyped up, right? Had to get in the mood to do the video, you know? I was really kind of just not feeling it and in a funk, and then I... Fraction Sky, gonna give it to you. Stay classy. Have a great freaking day. Thanks for watching.